right-handed. Okay. When I write, I'm very much right-handed. I'm very right-hand dominant. But when I have some weird things, like I throw people off because whenever we're doing things like <laughs> shoveling things, I will just switch arms or like throwing a baseball. I'm a switch thrower and can be. Don't know why. Um, Interesting. In high school, I was a switch hitter. Would go both ways with that. Uh, so I, I do a lot of things both both sides but so okay. that might be why because sometimes people see me do things with my left hand and it throws them off but anyway hi Blake <laughs> thanks for the concern I'm doing pretty well actually Mike and I were talking about this before we hit the button here but I see yeah, I don't want to force force Joe to do something if he's gonna pass out in the middle I, or anything it was itching 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 <clears throat> to get out of that apartment <laughs> that's what I decided <clears throat> Mike was gracious right. enough to let me have a reason to do that I will enable you <laughs> you did well with it thanks <laughs> oh hey check this out fountain pen time with Mike Ooh. I'm not sure if you can uh, is that wood Come on. this is hold on focus there this is a. Uh, actually, do you know what this is? No, I'm bad at this. Okay. I look at so many that this it's hard is, for me to differentiate them. This is a uh, a vintage Esterbrook J. Okay. In uh, ancient copper, no, ancient bronze. I don't know. Uh, but Anderson Pens had a vintage pen show the other day. Okay. And they had like, I don't know, maybe two, three hundred vintage pens. Okay. And uh, they op they listed them all online, but they had them in store the day before. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to the store the day before. <laughs> so I did. Cheer. Yep. And I got this one. <laughs> I'm a little bit kicking myself because they had a Parker Forty Five there, which was only like fifty, sixty bucks, but it had an Architect grind on it. Okay which a Parker 45 with an architect grind, like, I don't know. I'm not a big Parker fan, which is why I didn't buy it. But afterwards, I'm like, I should have bought that. <laughs> right. So you just mm. bought a whole bunch of pins or you just bought the one? I just bought the one. I showed restraint. <laughs> I do have another one on the way, though. <laughs> Good work. Good work. Proud of you. The uh, pen addict slack. There be dragons. <laughs> <laughs> It's a dangerous place. Can't trust those folks. <laughs> well, you can, which is the problem. Bought a couple pens there. I bought this matte black vanishing point for 90 bucks. Um, and I have a Pro Gear Slim Blue Dwarf on the way, also for 90 bucks. Pro Gear Slim. Slim what? Dwarf? Bl Blue Dwarf. It's Blue Dwarf. the model. Yep. It's a. North American limited edition, I believe, but uh, it's a cool looking pen and it was like 250, 300 bucks when it sure. came out. I was like, a little too rich for my blood and then someone listed one for 90 with shipping and I couldn't resist. Good work. How much ink did you buy? Blake wants to know. I didn't buy any ink, but I have, <laughs> let me see, probably 30 to 40 bottles on my desk right <laughs> in front of me here. <laughs> I had someone... <laughs> Who saw that? And they're like, are those all your potions? <laughs> this is this is how no, I get so much I'm done. No, I'm not a warlock. Just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good work, sir. Yeah. All right. I should open up Audio Hijack. Oh, that reminds <clears> me. I should start my backup recorder. Check, check, check. <coughs> I think we're good. I don't sound too off, do I? I think mm -mm. I... Because I feel like I sound different, but I don't know if I actually do or not. That's that's always the trick with this stuff. <laughs> you sound a little bit... Uh, a little bit funky, but... A little funky. I can go with funky. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like something from Hogwarts. It kind of does... Um... Hold on, I'm gonna grab a photo here quick. Just for the live listeners. 
to get all this great bonus content. All right, so I am going to upload this to the cloud app, hopefully. Can I drag something in there out of photos, maybe? Yes, yes I can, okay. So uh, this was not meant to be shared publicly okay. necessarily, but there <laughs> so you go. Here we are, public. <laughs> yep, there is my desk. Where is this at? All right, come on. Uh, this is Like, where at, are you sharing home. this? Uh, sorry, in the YouTube chat. Okay. So everyone can see. I don't see it there yet. That is... Really? Maybe it's just me. You don't see that share.getcloudapp.com link? Nope, I don't. Is that just me? <laughs> I see... Five of Blake's comments, mine, and then another one after that. Hasn't shown... What the? Why is it not showing up? I mean, I can show you my my screenshot right here. Like, it, it is on my YouTube. I don't get it. Do you have to approve the link I, I sent? Um, If it's a link, YouTube might block those. Uh. YouTube jerks. I wonder if I can copy direct link. Let's try this. I wonder if I can control that. Let's try this again. Well, I doubt that's going to work, but okay, here, here, <laughs> that's here, here. crazy. I'm trying to figure out there's, through? there's like a, oh no, there's a thing that says block links and it's unchecked. Well, I can't That's customize the, the thing, but it's share.getcloudapp.com slash J as in Joe, K as in, I don't know, King, U, uh, capital L, capital B as in bookworm, lowercase E, lowercase O, uppercase E. And I'm sorry that you have to type that whole thing. That's really annoying. But when you do, what you will see is my desk. And it's a little bit messy. But we've got uh, two DSLRs here. We've got two, no, three different microphones, um, two audio interfaces. And behind the audio interfaces to the right of the left speaker are all of the potions. I mean, ink bottles. <laughs> Can you text me a link to your YouTube channel that's associated with your user account? Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, it's usually yeah, like some random second. long thing. Like if you go top right and hit your channel. Yeah. Uh, give me a second. And we don't have to do that right now if you don't want. But. There's a no, way I can okay. add you as a moderator, and then it'll let stuff like that go through. Oh, uh, okay. Hey, by the way, I'm at 97 accidental subscribers, so I can almost get my own URL. That's actually why I moved my channel to a different location, because <laughs> my old, old, old one was so old that it was grandfathered into. <laughs> it was grandfathered into it. And I had the custom URL on it, even though there were zero subscribers. So that made it a mess <laughs> because I wanted to add yeah. that URL for the other channel that I was building and couldn't do it. Nice. I think All I'm right. an admin now. I got, a, I got a wrench next to my name. Now try to paste your thing in. See if that works. Okay, I'll try to paste the whole link. A second. Oh, I saw that that you pasted. The one part yeah. that... Blake asked me there, and now it looks like it's a link. Sweetness. Now life. So my desk is uh here. my desk is re is ridiculous. Uh, I would imagine if people were to walk into my office right now, they would be uh probably a lot intimidated and a little bit concerned. Well, I'm concerned about a lot of the stuff you know that I know that you have on your desk. So yes. <laughs> Like, wait, what? How do you work there? There's so much, so many buttons. There's a lot there. It's true. Um, including an A10 Mini now. 
Double microphones, triple microphones. Yep. So the got, uh, you got the Neumann, you got the Beta 87A. What is it? A Rode that's, NTG. Okay. NTG. That's one. a Rode Video Mic Pro Plus. Video Mic Pro. I was, I was yep. close. And so that one is the one the I phone. use when I record directly to the camera for okay. video stuff. And then also that's the input that the ATEM Mini takes. Got it. You did buy the Mini. I did. Nice. You can see it on there. Yeah, to the right of the stream deck. Oh, I do see it. I've been looking I don't, at I haven't... using something like that to do like the stream mm. video switching stuff, but it's cool. My cameras aren't fancy enough for it. My Canon 5D Mark III shuts off after 30 minutes. It's a hardware limitation. Back in the day when they made it, if it was less than 30 minutes, it wasn't classified as a camcorder. And so you had to pay a lot less taxes when you shipped them to the UK. <laughs> sure. That's seriously the reason. It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> and then the the uh, EOS 70D doesn't have clean HDMI out. The so I tried Magic Lantern. Because mm. I've seen the 60D Not the... quite a few things, I think. Well, you can plug it in USB, but HDMI, there isn't a clean HDMI out. Sure. The newer ones have it, like the 90D, for example. Oh, maybe um, that's what I was 70, thinking of. 70D is like 2013, 2014, somewhere around there. Sure. So it's it's older. That's the one I'm looking at right now. Uh, I use Cascable for like the webcam stuff. But... Got it. I'm using a GoPro. The right pen now. holder. Uh, yeah. So the pen holder, that's the from the WellPoint. No, not WellPointed Desk. What's the company? It's a pen well, and it allows you to take your pens, uh, uncap them, and use them with one hand. <laughs> and then to the right, the humidor-looking thing that's not a box of cigars. That is my pen box. Sure. Uh -huh. Although they don't all fit there anymore. Whatever you got to tell yourself. <laughs> <laughs> People see that thing, and that's what they think of at first. It's like, is that a humidor? No. <laughs> People think this is a flask. I don't know why. People gotta get, do. people gotta get their their heads out of the gutter. Come on, guys. It's totally true. <clears throat> All right, should we record a podcast? We probably should. That's kind of the intent here. Yep. Last time. Right, I'm just gonna make sure audio hijack is working okay. It looks like that's fine. <clears throat> you can hear me. I can hear you. Anything else we need to go over before we officially start? Um. Just that. Oh yes. Did I just? Send I you? clicked save, and it is downloading. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very strong flask, Blake. Solid. <laughs> <laughs> My flask game, it's on point. <laughs> no, All I think right. I've got my. Okay, then let's. Do it. All right. Three, two, one. Oh, shoot. We got to start over. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I accidentally hit it, and then I stopped, and then had to hit it again, but it only went to the distance I had recorded the first time. So anyway, sorry. We got to do it again. All right. All right, ready? Yep. I'm going to clap because mine's still rolling. Three. Two, one. How you feeling, Joe Bulig? Doing pretty well. I think so, anyway. Everybody thinks I'm dying, but I'm not. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, for those who haven't been following you on, on Twitter, uh, you're not feeling the greatest, but you're muscling through for the, the bookworm fans. It's so true. We, we appreciate that. It's true. This past weekend, I started to cough and got a fever and a few things and thought, those sound very familiar for symptoms. Joe's a positive person now. That's that's what I've been telling mm. people. Is I'm, a, I'm a positive person. And I had to cancel a couple things this week and have been slowly catching up trying to figure out what all is going on in the world that I've missed since I kind of just hibernated in red books. Uh, and 
now. I'm not that there's anything wrong with that. Absolutely not. I'm now emerging for the first time since all of that began, and we're here. I think I might sound all a little right. funny, but other than that, I feel fine. I don't really have any symptoms to speak of at this point, so that's kind of where good. I sit. I'm glad you're feeling better, but now if we go a little bit off the rails an hour into the episode, people know why. <laughs> yep, exactly. So if Joe starts to ramble incoherently, now you know why. <laughs> that is it, 100%. <laughs> All right. Well, I am glad to be recording this episode with you. I am looking forward to talking about today's book. Uh, before we do that, we've got a little bit of follow-up that we should touch on here. Uh, did you make your working procedures? Started to. I started to put together some, and I specifically did this for my work stuff. And that has been... <laughs> the nice part is that I started doing that last week and worked with my assistant to put those together. And was, we were in the process of checklisting some things. And then Joe disappeared <laughs> for a week, mm -hmm. and he was able to just take those in and run with them. I really haven't been consulted at all this week as a result of that. We even had a couple of folks step in who had never done some events and never done some different pieces, and they did really well with it, having not ever touched certain hardware and were able to work the, the checklists and systems and follow the things and be in pretty good shape. So... I would call that a success. Now, obviously, there are a lot of procedures that are yet to be documented. I don't think we'll ever get done with that. But it's encouraging to see that it at least helps in one arena. Now, there are a lot of other arenas, personally, that I want to do this for. But Joe's motivation and energy level has been a little subpar. So we're not, we're not there, obviously. So <laughs> <laughs> is what it is. Sure. Well, the fact that nothing completely blew up while you were gone, at least to your knowledge, uh, I would consider that a huge win. <laughs> yep. Yep. There was an event that happened last night that they moved into a different room, which meant that I had to have a sound tech for it. And I didn't really know anything about it because they just, they just took care of it, which is exactly what I wanted to happen. <laughs> so I'm not going to argue at Beautiful. all. Beautiful. All right, your second one here is the general operating principles, the GOPs. Uh, is that kind of related, or is this something I think separate on that you can one, report on? You could probably on? just draw a line through it. <laughs> Joe, right. I, I didn't even attempt this. I, I looked at it on the list, and I thought, that's cool. No, we're not, not going to go there. That's just... Mm -mm. <laughs> so... It's not a thing I even attempted because the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, this is a cool idea. I understand the intent behind this. I just don't think it's going to be something that's going to work out for me, at least in the short term. It might be something for the long term, but I don't have enough people involved with what I'm doing to make that worthwhile. Right now, like for sure. work, it's me and one part-timer underneath of me. For the stuff I do online, it doesn't really go beyond me i mean maybe we could do it for bookworm but that seems excessive but no i didn't even touch this one i didn't even attempt it i looked at it <laughs> once and thought uh-uh <laughs> well if you wanted to do this for bookworm i'm fine with that but i feel at this point we know what bookworm is yeah and some people love it some people wish it was something different and i had some different Correct. stories to tell <laughs> but yep. I'm we've, working on it. I'm working we've, on it. We've <laughs> gathered feedback over the years at this point, and most of the time we review the feedback if we review it. And when we do, that's cool. Or it's <laughs> it's probably more so that Joe comes up with some random ideas like maybe we could change the format and do this, and Mike's like, but then people wouldn't get this, and I'm like, well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, so. I I'm the one I'm I'm the grandpa who doesn't like change, so. That I force you into is. change once in a while. Like you we're do. live streaming you on do. YouTube right now. So I do force you into it occasionally. 
yep video was never a thing that i would have agreed to when we started this yep. <laughs> it's true it's true and yet here we are and it's turned out really well i yep. think so it's true hey on the topic of feedback by the way and not <laughs> replying all the time there is one person in particular if you look at the bookworm club who represents about a hand uh, i don't know half a dozen fiction authors who is yeah. just desperate to get one of them on the show correct <laughs> it's not gonna happen <laughs> yes i i rather enjoy like this is this is maybe the sick twisted part of my brain in that there are a number of people who send us these will you review my book i wrote this sci-fi thriller and i i want some pr like these people send us these things all the time and yeah. i rather enjoy skimming them i don't ever actually read them because they're way too long but <laughs> they're entertaining at least to read it's like oh please read my memoir and share it with your audience like no nah. <laughs> no you're the best not part Jobs. is the follow-ups that, so. <laughs> <laughs> the best part is all the follow-up messages oh yeah because, definitely uh it's kind of implied that you're gonna at least get back to them and then when you don't Yep. They, they they kind of don't know what to do. It's Correct. Like, well, you must be really busy or <laughs> no, sorry. Yep. Still <laughs> not going to respond. respond. <laughs> it's usually three or four though. It's at least, yep. we know it's at least two that you'll hear from every one of them. Sometimes you get the third, sometimes you get a fourth. I do get... Uh, I feel bad for are... those people because I, I used to have to do that. but <laughs> Sure, there are some that make it into like my personal email spam filters because there's another email address that I used to have on the site that would forward into that but I don't ever respond to those either so there are more even than what we see through that system Mike <laughs> which is saying something wow. <laughs> on the topic of fiction though bombshell breaking news Mike is going to read a fiction book and joe is going to force him <laughs> i don't know so okay we have to back up because that that sounds way different than what i think it actually is <laughs> because sure sure well okay not... so let me let me talk about this real quick <laughs> uh you have been trying to get me to read fiction for a long time <laughs> recently david sparks has also been trying to get me to read fiction Kindred spirits and we have the relay members special that we have to record for focused so uh david floated the idea of reading a fiction book and i said well if we're going to do that i gotta include joe on this because <laughs> this has been his drum that he's been banging for the last several years <laughs> yes so we are going to read hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and talk about it for the focused members special which will go out to all the relay fm members so you don't need to be a member of focus specifically but if you are then you will also get that special episode it will not be part of the normal feed and i am a little bit terrified joe i have no idea what to expect i feel like i can walk in one of these bookworm recordings and just off the cuff talk about anything in my mind node file i have no idea what reading a fiction book is going to do to this <laughs> workflow i think we're gonna force you to get in touch with your emotions, Mike. Also, I just want to point <laughs> out some comments in the chat here. And the earth is ending. Now I have to watch out for flying pigs at work. <laughs> like <laughs> these are these are the things in the chat at the moment. So this is a big deal, and I'm I'm excited for you. I'm nervous for you, but I'm excited for you. <laughs> I think this will be fun. It'll be a good time. Yeah, that's for sure. But, <laughs> yes, it will. Regardless, this is something Mike texted me and said, hey, we have this idea about reading a fiction book. Are you in? I'm like, obviously, why would I not? Like, all the <laughs> things line up. All the stars have aligned. And here we are with Mike volunteering himself to read a fiction book. And that's why I said that earlier. It's like, this is True. not a thing where I pitched something that would offer you the opportunity to read a fiction book this was you reaching yep. out to me saying hey here's yep. this idea it's like, obviously i'm a yes i'm all in <laughs> and it was really instigated by my kids because we were watching the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy movie not too long ago we love that movie and i know yep. it's based on those books and my kids were looking for something to read over the summer and i'm like hey would you be interested in reading there's a whole series of books 
that uh, this movie is based on. They're like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So we got the whole set from from Amazon. We're just gonna read the first one for the special episode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my so my 11 year old Joshua, he is cranking through the first one. He's almost done with it already, and he wants to talk to me about it too. So nice. I have internal pressure. I have pressure from all the sides to be <laughs> read fiction now. <laughs> good for you. Good for you. It's good to know that more than one person is willing to pressure you into uh, a more enjoyable experience with books, right? Well, that is to be determined, but we will see. <laughs> we're going to we're going to have a runoff of bookworm next. It's like bookworm fiction. <laughs> Maybe we'll see. <laughs> but that'll just be the. We'll just have a whole separate show that's like gap book episodes, and it's nothing but fiction books. You in? I think that's something you could get behind for sure. Maybe. <laughs> Let's see how the first one goes. I'm not committing to anything. <laughs> and we're not even putting it on bookworm. So here we are. <laughs> yeah. Well, we did just do an episode. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure if you listened to it, but I haven't uh, yet. I saw it, but I haven't. Focus. Yeah reading and learning. Uh, I did not see this, but um, David had a lot of complimentary things to say about Bookworm. He basically said, this is how he decides what books to listen to. So that was that was super cool to hear. And I also got some great feedback from a couple of people in my mastermind about the uh, Work the System episode. Um, one person in particular said that they just love the, the conversational aspect of it and uh, got a lot out of it, but also like agreed that maybe the the whole book wasn't uh wasn't worth investing the time to to read you know just get the the gist of it don't maybe buy that one just download the pdf whatever so i guess we're staying true to our accidental mission of being the filter for people deciding what books to read <laughs> it's so true I, I i look back on that sometimes and i'm amazed that we missed that you, do you ever yeah realize that it's like we started this as something that we thought people would join us in reading this uh, reading books in two weeks and then we'll talk about it and then we could have a discussion with those who have read it uh, online like that was kind of our thought process when we started this and didn't realize that we would be the not very short version of <laughs> Blinkist. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> we should have known, Joe Bulig, that people would be looking for a more effortless path to knowledge acquisition. Ooh. <laughs> Which Nailed leads it. us into today's book, <laughs> <laughs> which is Effortless by Greg McKeon, a follow up to Essentialism, which I think was one of uh, both of us, one of our favorite books that we've ever read. Uh, very strong message, at least that was my recollection of, of reading it. I've read it several times and just kind of the right thing at the right time, uh, which maybe is a little bit unfair to this book because I don't know how you follow up essentialism with another book as good as essentialism. <laughs> but we're going to get into that in a, a minute here. Uh, the The format of this book is, of course, three separate parts which I was very disappointed in. I figured if anybody could escape the three-part format, it would be Greg McKeon. <laughs> but no, part one is effortless state. Part two is effortless action. Part two is effortless results. Uh, I have issues with the way these are broken up. There are exactly five chapters in each of these. And it seems like he kind of made these because he wanted those charts at the end. Uh, of each section, which was kind of the, the summary. Uh, some of these are definitely stronger than others. Uh, what was your initial impressions of this book before we get into the first part one here? Like preconceived expectations or overall thoughts on it? Yeah, so what was your, imp what were you thinking of prior to diving into this book? And then what was your initial impressions uh, through the the beginning of it, um, we'll get into like how it, how it ended, you know, sure. as we get through the the sections here. But like, were you? Oh yeah, this is exactly what I expected. Or were you kind of skeptical because there's no way he can follow up essentialism? Or were you kind of let down because it wasn't as good as you thought it was going to be? Where do I land? How did on it start it? off sure. for you? So yeah. the the thing that was interesting to me is that we came off of work the system into this, and we had 
Sam Carpenter kind of running his telephone business at us and was explaining like how you put systems together and how you can optimize them and how everything is a system. And we came off of that into this, right? And in my head, because I had Sam Carpenter's mantras floating around in my brain whenever I picked this up, the first thing I thought of whenever I read the word effortless and then the tagline because I have the book behind me, so I can't actually read it unless I pick it up and bring it over here. Uh, the tagline is, make it easier to do what matters most. And in my head, that meant systems. Because we came from work the system and, and, and worked into this one. And that's fine. But I don't know that Greg McEwen would say that his book on Effortless is about systems. I mean, he probably would if you tried to define a system into like general working on tasks and projects. I think he could probably get there, but I don't think that was his intent there. But that's what I came into it with. So knowing essentialism and having read that and appreciated that, this having worked the system in the background and also your explanation of it whenever you first introduced it, of his background and why he wrote it and how he got to this point in, in putting this book together because of all that background it ended up being pretty much what I expected because it does fit a lot of that I, I don't know that there's any specific point at which I was surprised but at the same time like there's a lot of good nuggets in this one I think so I don't know if that answers what you're sure. after, but that's, no, that's exactly what that's yeah. exactly what I was going for. Uh, because I agree that work the system tainted. It did <laughs> this one. It did it bled over. <laughs> but I do feel that this one kind of feels more like a natural follow up to work the system than it does essentialism. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Which that maybe is an unfair statement to say because you're kind of in a tough spot as an author. You wrote this book, Essentialism, which completely blew up. And if he would have kept referring back to, as I said, in essentialism, we probably would have that. docked him for that, right? So he's got to just leave that behind and, and go to the new thing, uh, whatever that happens to be. Uh, I will say at the very beginning here, I don't think he knocked this one out of the park like he did essentialism. Uh, but I don't know how you, you can. Maybe essentialism is that lightning in a bottle, once in a lifetime sort of a thing that, you know, there's no way you're going to be able to follow up to that sort of thing. I think very few authors are able to follow up with a book like that with another book that is as good. Probably the closest that I've seen is Cal Newport in all the stuff that he's written following up with, with deep work. But even those, like they don't resonate on the same level for us anyways, like deep work did. But I use him as an example because there are several books by him that I really enjoy, including So Good That They Can't Ignore You, which I would argue maybe is my favorite, even above uh, Deep Work. We talked about that when we did the, the draft episodes back in the day. I think it was episode 50 when we picked our favorite non-bookworm books. Uh, if people want to hear us talk about that one, they should go vote for it in the club, by the way. So, uh, yeah, this book, I mean, the very first chapter they have like this little tagline associated with it and it is is there an easier way so let's jump in here to part one effortless state uh, i really don't know exactly how to define what he's talking about with effortless state this is kind of like the fundamental building blocks in my opinion kind of like the perspective stuff you need to understand but the term state i get this picture of somebody like sitting on a rock meditating and i don't think that's really what he's he's going for with this really is trying to get us to think about the things that we do, the things that are essential, and then how do we make those essential things easier to do? Because we, we really only have a couple of options when we can't do all of the essential things. We can let some essential things fall through the cracks and not do them, or we can make those essential things easier so that we, ha we have more resources to devote to the other essential things. Uh, I think that is the insidious backstory <laughs> to this this book that he doesn't explicitly address, but is right there, is essentially 
what he's doing with this book is enabling people like past me who want to just squeeze in one more thing because you justify it by saying, well, I made the other stuff easier. So yeah, now I can fill that space. And if I were to go back and tell past Mike one thing, it would be do not touch that space. <laughs> you leave that space alone. That is sacred. That's what we call margin. You should hold on to that, sir. <laughs> exactly. I don't think I had this reaction. I think effortless state made a lot of sense to me. In, but but it's because <laughs> this this is horrible systems thinking like that's that's what crossed my mind when I went here and I don't know if this is a testament to how well Sam Carpenter put that book together but or, or just the place that we are comparing it to effortless against but in my mind he's talking about my mind and the way that I process inputs i guess in the way that i view the work that i'm doing the tasks the the things i'm choosing to act on but the the piece here that's maybe a little difficult to get my head around on it is that he doesn't ever point out what aspect of life he's referring to and i think maybe that's why you're you're having that because he doesn't say that we're going to talk about how we use our time. He's not talking about how we use our actions. He's kind of floating amongst those two plus your mental state and the way that you choose to take care of your body. And like, he doesn't ever actually say, this is the realm that I want to focus on. He bounces all over and doesn't seem to have a dedicated path of working through those. Maybe he does. I just didn't see it. That's, that's very mm -hmm. possible and that he had a path and I just didn't recognize it but that's not one that I, I noticed anyway so he doesn't ever nail it down and it's not a clear path forward for this uh, but I will say he does talk about the two ways to achieve all the work that really matters those are his words all the work that really matters sure <laughs> alright so right there <laughs> I think I have issues with this but his two options are gain superhuman powers so we can do all the impossibly hard but worthwhile work uh, or get better at making the impossibly make, get better at making the impossibly hard work uh, as possibly let me try it again get better <laughs> at making the impossibly hard but worthwhile work easier and i think that is important but that is only applicable up to a certain point and the images that he draws here uh, I think don't do that justice. Like he's got a picture of a giant snowball that you're pushing uphill and it says maximum effort and then tiny results and then flip that over instead of pushing it uphill. If you're pushing it downhill, tiny effort and maximum results. And in a best case scenario, yes, that is true. I think asking that question, what if this could be easy is really important and powerful and he calls that effortless inversion that's the whole gist of this first chapter invert but i also think it has limited application uh, and i'm trying to reconcile in my head the things that he is telling me here in this book and all of the things that i have heard for a very long time which i am questioning think again by adam grant right but if it's worth doing it's going to be difficult. If it was easy, everyone would do it. I, I think there's a little bit of truth to that. So I don't believe that it's simply I haven't discovered the effortless path to some of the things that I'm doing. I think some of the things that I'm doing are difficult and that's okay because they're worth doing anyways. Uh, I think there's a lot of parallels you could draw there. Some of the obvious ones would be with parenting. I think bookworm is definitely an example. I mean, we don't really make money from bookworm. This is the definition of a passion project. And it takes a lot of hours to read the books and to edit them and to publish them. Like the reason there aren't a bunch of other podcasts like this is because it's a ton of work and who's crazy enough to do that. So. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things that I, I think around this one growing up on the farm you tended to agree right it it's only the hard stuff that really matters the simple stuff the easy stuff doesn't get corn to grow 
Like that, that was kind of a perspective that was passed, at least to me. Now, granted, in today's farming world, with the size of equipment and how much automation they've done, I think it's crazy simple, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but when I was starting, like it was not like filling a corn planter meant carrying 50 pound bags of seed around and tearing the tops off and manually dumping them into buckets. Now they just take a big tube and they flick a switch and it fills the big center hopper and they sit there and drink a Coke while they fill it up. So <laughs> that's how it goes now. Anyway, all that to say, you know, there's, there's a thing here where if it's worth doing, it's difficult or anything that's worth, you know, if it were easy, everyone would do it. That whole concept. I think Greg would probably say that there might be some truth to that. I don't think he would say it's absolutely false, but I think the piece that he would add into that is that it means that we simply haven't thought about it the right way. That's, I think, where he's coming sure. at with this effortless state in that, yes, it's difficult. At least on the surface, it's difficult. But that either means that the task itself isn't being, like, it's being done too well. Like, there was the story of the videography team that was asked to put together the recordings for a professor. That's a great story, yep. And... Basically, the professor asked this gal to record some of his lectures. And in her mind, she immediately went to full-on multi-camera videography team that's then doing the animated graphics and stuff to build these so that they could be reused multiple times in the future. That's where her brain went. She asks the professor, what is your intent with these? Oh, well, I have one student that's in sports and can't make the class and wants to catch up. Hey, guess what? It's not multi months of work. It's somebody sitting there with their phone kicked on. Like, <laughs> this is yeah. worlds different. And I think some of what this effortless state part, part one here, is just helping us to step away from our assumptions with these things. Because it's easy to jump into big, overblown, massive project like that's where my brain goes a lot of times people ask me for a recording a video recording and i'm thinking about setting up lights i've got these fancy like over i've got like a twelve thousand dollar video camera over there like i've got those all the video like audio gear like that's where my brain goes whenever they ask me about trying to record a video but a lot of times they just need to share a video with like two people it's like oh we'll just set up your computer turn on the webcam hit record <laughs> like you don't need this big thing, but that's where my brain goes. And some of what I think yep. Greg is trying to encourage us to do is don't jump to the big complicated path. Think about the simplest, most straightforward way to get the job done. And oftentimes that means it is easy. So the concept of if it were easy, everyone would do it. If getting the results was easy, then everyone would do it. Right. But I think the actions that get to those results can be easy, but I think you have to think about them differently and be willing to not go the 10 extra miles in a lot of cases. So again, you're probably right. There is some validity in it, but I think there are some, some ways to shortcut it at the same time. Yeah. Well, that story in particular, I like that story, but it also bugs me <laughs> because I am also guilty of overthinking things. Uh, but that is an example of, I don't know if they were getting paid for this or if they're doing it as a favor, whatever. If you're doing it as a job, then on one level, you probably don't care how complex things get because you're going to get paid for the complexity. You're the professional, right? So assuming it's a favor, then what you're doing is you're trying to figure out a way to accommodate all these people who are asking you to do things. And that I have fallen into the trap of more than once and it always bugs me when I, I do uh, and I do have that approach I think of when someone asks me to do something if I do want to accommodate them I do tend to overthink it but what's even simpler is just saying no <laughs> so again like he wrote essentialism so I know he gets this and I feel like this is kind of lost in the translation if you just look at this book in isolation though is 
well, yeah, maybe this particular thing went from a thousand hours worth of effort because it was a thousand hours when they were talking about it initially to a couple of hours. But what does that simplification, what sort of behavior does that encourage going forward? More accommodating of people who just want you to solve their problems? No, thank you. Uh, but if you, in a personal sense, then this is something completely different than the story that he's telling. Because now what you're trying to do is make something, let's say, because that's probably the angle you and I would come at this with as creators. And with a creator, yeah, there are ways that you can simplify things, but only to a point like the farmer example that you mentioned, if you can, if you have the machinery and can automate stuff like that's cool, more power to you. But at some point you still have to plant the seed in the ground. Like you can't automate that part yet. Anyways, I can't automate the creation of a podcast episode. I can't have a robot sitting here and record this conversation with you, nor would I want to because the quality would not be there. And in the example of the, the class lecture, the quality doesn't matter. So I think there's lots of different variables here, which completely change this scenario when I apply it in any way that resembles my life. <laughs> and I don't really know how to reconcile that. Well, in this particular case, she was like the head of media at the school. So that was a lot of her job is doing that sort of thing for professors and, and employees of the school. So sure, sure, it's her job really to do that. But she's choosing what her teams work on at the same time. So there's a lot of dynamics in that one, I think. Yep. Yep. No, and that's, that's fine. Uh, I mean, the, the next chapter kind of talks about pairing the essential and the enjoyable. This is kind of a different application of that concept. Um, I just, that story in isolation just kind of yeah. bugs me because yeah, I have so sure. many questions about what would you say in this scenario, Greg, yep. <laughs> he doesn't right. get into it. In some ways, this, this book is, is kind of short. I mean, he's got a lot of visuals in here and it's 200, 15 pages or something like that but there's lots of like charts and things where he's restating things that he's already said it could have been quite a bit longer and i feel like a lot of this stuff he just doesn't get into it nearly as deep as he he could have um this next part though with with enjoy like what if this could be fun i, I think this is the one that really resonates with me like i think there's a lot of opportunity here for me uh, one example of this that I thought of pairing something essential with something that's enjoyable. I've got this rowing machine, which Blake encouraged me to buy. <laughs> I don't really have any sort of, like, I don't really watch YouTube videos, but I know that there are a lot of things on YouTube that I, I kind of want to watch, but I, I haven't really engaged with it because I just don't have the time to, to do it. Well, I can reinforce the essential activity of working out if I pair it with something that I want to do, which is watch these YouTube videos so I can pull up a queue and now the rowing machine that becomes my, my YouTube time. Um, and there's lots of other ways that you can do this sort of thing. Uh, he uses an example in the book of how they were trying to get everybody to clear the table after dinner. Everybody just takes off and I've got homework and they disappear in their rooms or whatever. So what they did is they tried to make that more fun. And now they just sing Disney tunes at the top of their lungs while they're, <laughs> they're cleaning the dinner table, which sounds very ridiculous. Uh, I've, I actually have a lot of trouble picturing that because I've, I've watched the webinar that he and his wife did. I can totally see Greg doing this. I'm not sure I can see his <laughs> wife or his kids doing it, <laughs> but, uh, that's a that's a cool example, I think. And it has me thinking about what are the, he calls them building blocks of joy that I can add to my own rituals, which is a whole nother section here. And I thought this was kind of cool. We've read lots of books on habits, right? But rituals are kind of like groups of habits. And he defines them as the habits are the what you do, but the rituals are the how you do it. And I feel like that's a really cool way to, to think about it. Uh, and it's probably a lot more approachable than something like habit stacking, <laughs> all the like the technical stuff that we read about in Atomic Habits and Tiny Habits. For the average person, the rituals of like how you get the things done, that I think opens itself up to a lot more uh, 
a lot more uh, what he's trying to get people to do you know where you apply some some flavor to this some element of fun to this uh, that's a lot more applicable for the average person i would argue do you have an example offhand i was trying to think of a good example of how you take a habit and convert it into a ritual do you have something offhand for that i was trying to think of one that i've done but i don't have a good example that i'm coming up with well i think the when i think of ritual i think of like my morning routine and each one of the things that are in my morning routine started off as an individual habit that i had to build but now they all kind of roll together or like a shutdown routine that would be a you could reframe that as like a shutdown ritual where i empty all my inboxes and i time block the next day you know and essentially in my mind it's stacking these habits together but when you link them together like a series of dominoes there's some momentum that carries over from one to the next so you can do a whole bunch of things with a small amount of of effort for example when i wake up if you were to actually like write out my morning routine it's kind of ridiculous it's something like drink 20 ounces of water read my Bible, spend time in prayer, do my stretches, uh, shower, make coffee. But all of that stuff happens in like a 30, 45 minute period. And it happens kind of automatically where like I struggle even to like think through the pieces there Wait, what do I because I just do it. Exactly. Like I fill up my water bottle before I go to bed at night and I set it by my uh, on the nightstand. So the very first thing that I do when I get up is I chug 20 ounces of water to get my, my body going. I don't think about that. I just see the water bottle and I drink it. It's it's just automatic at, at this point. Um, but I think if you never really considered building your habits, uh, linking them together, that's really what the ritual ritual is. Sure. It takes a little bit more time, but it's also the kind of thing where I'm going to block an hour on my calendar for this thing. And then I'm going to cram as much positive stuff as I in there as I can in there and just knock down all those dominoes at one time. Yeah, that's very fair. I mean, I, I do a lot with like the morning routine process as well. And I think that can be a good one. I was trying to think through something that was day-to-day -day project, almost checklist related. And to me, those aren't necessarily rituals. I mean, <laughs> Japanese tea ceremony. But the the thing that did come to mind... I have a process I kind of go through before we start recording, before I start doing live streams, before I run a webinar. I have a whole series. I just ran through 60 plus items that I checked off before we started recording here. And that was before you and I ever connected on the video system. So before we ever connected, I had run that and then that was done, but I have this process post that setup of mostly just sitting and staring is what it looks like, but it's me thinking through the process of what is this going to look like? What are the things I need to make sure I bring up? Usually I've got my notepad and I'm writing a handful of things down that I want to make sure that I'm going to bring up, uh, things that pop into my head that have nothing to do with what I'm getting ready to do. That kind of acts like a ritual because I've done it so many times mm -hmm. now that it just kind of has that feel. It doesn't have to be, but in my case, I think it does. It does qualify for that. Absolutely. I mean, ritual, I think this is the, the powerful part about the way Greg McKeon frames it is don't overthink it. <laughs> Whatever you do, uh, it's the, 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 what did I say? It's the how you do it. So it's kind of like the, um, the why behind it it's not the specifics of what you are actually doing. A, a part of my getting ready to record really any podcast, but Bookworm specifically, because it's at this 1 p.m. Central time slot. I've already eaten lunch. I'm going to make sure that the outline is good to go. If it's my episode, I'm going to review my, my MindNode file so I kind of know where things are, what I want to talk about. I'm going to make my coffee. I'm going to bring it down to my office. Like that all gets me in a certain state for the podcast itself. And I don't ever stop and think about 
all of the individual levers that I'm pulling there. It's just part of the process and I know that it works. And so I, I think identifying the different rituals that you have, that's kind of the place to start with this. And we're not going to turn this into another habits episode. I, I promise. <laughs> we're trying to though. But the, the other thing with this, uh, cause the next chapter is all about release and, and gratitude. Uh, I think when it comes to the rituals, there's value in understanding what you're currently doing and realizing that that has a, a purpose. Yes, you can cut some things out and add some different things if you want to craft these in a specific way. If you want to make positive changes, this is the place to do it. But you don't go into it thinking there are all of these other people who are doing all of these amazing things and I am so far behind them because I am not doing everything that they are doing as part of their routines or rituals. That will just make you miserable. Nothing will ever stick. You're not going to do anything. So I think there's, uh, there's power in coupling this gratitude section to this. Like I am glad that I get to make coffee and look at an outline and sit down and record a podcast. Right? I'm not looking at it through the process or through the lens of I'm trying to maximize my output. I am enjoying the journey. And that's really where the gratitude piece comes in. You're not, it's gap versus gain. You know, you're, you're looking at where you were and recognizing the growth from where you started as opposed to thinking about where you wish you were and measuring how far you have to go. That's the whole issue I have with goals is like, as soon as you get to, as soon as you close that gap, as soon as you cross that finish line, there is now another gap to be crossed and the finish line has moved. The goalposts are farther out, maybe farther out than they've ever been. Uh, and now you just feel discouraged because, well, this took a Herculean amount of effort for me to get to this point. How am I ever going to get to that other thing? I can't sustain this, right? But you can, if you enjoy the process. There's a, there's a lot to be said. I think you brought up this whole gratitude versus release concept. And I think there's probably a ton that we could say about that. It seems like gratitude is one that has come up numerous times, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is something we do with our kids. Not, I wouldn't say every meal, but occasionally we'll like, what was the best part of your day? Like we'll ask that question. And it seems so routine to me, but it is interesting to learn from a four-year-old what the best part of her day was. <laughs> Eating mac and cheese is sometimes the answer. Or the six-year-old will <laughs> like, oh, I was able to color. I'm like, okay. Good news, I saw a dog today. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It's like, hey dad, guess what? Over rest time, I counted 178 cars. I'm like, why? Like, that's that's what goes through my head, right? <laughs> but you're like, that's amazing. Number one, I didn't know you could count that high. Number two, that's some intense focus to be willing to sit there and just stare at cars driving by for <laughs> an hour. So <laughs> that's intense. But these are the things we don't even pay attention to, right? But asking kids what was the best part of your day is often a fascinating conversation that comes from it. But yep. yes, gratitude. <laughs> yeah. And this is one of those things that I kind of wish he would have got in a little bit deeper. Um, he has some cool visuals in this section about the different directions when you focus on what you lack versus focusing on the things that you have. Uh, on page 58, he says, when you focus on what you lack, you lose what you have. When you focus on what you have, you get what you lack. And that's a great one liner, <laughs> but this section is, is kind of, kind of short. Maybe we need to tackle a whole book on gratitude. Probably, at some point. Cause I feel like there's a lot of ways we could go with that one. This is like, I just had a conversation with my wife about this one in that if, if you're focusing on the bad things that are happening right now, you tend to just completely gloss over the good things. And if you're focused on all the good things, you can sometimes gloss over all of the bad things. Like those are yep. the things that I was having a conversation with her about because like, look at our life situation. We're moved into an apartment. We are trying to find a house. I do fine with change. My wife does not. The limbo is driving her nuts, not knowing what comes next because we don't have a place located yet. 
So these are all things that really bother her. They don't even register for me a lot of times. I really don't want to live in an apartment, but it's still something that is important to her. So yeah, it's easy to focus on all the bad things that we don't like about our living situation right now, but that's not the point. It's better to pay attention to, I have zero yard work. House maintenance doesn't exist because it's a phone call. Like mm -hmm. these are all things that make life super easy. Those are the things that we need to be paying attention to. Otherwise, it's easy to fall down the negativity bandwagon. Yep, totally. So again, the next section here on rest, uh, he could have spoken a lot more, I don't want to say eloquently, but it feels kind of like he did a little bit of research on this enough to sound smart when he says that it's your responsibility to relax but there's so much more to be said here uh this one specifically i mean we've talked about sleep before so we won't spend a whole, a whole lot of time on. here we did yep so again all of these individual chapters have a lot more that can be said this one specifically i put it in the outline though because i feel like i could have written a better section for him on this one <laughs> And sure. that's completely unfair to Greg based on my situation and kind of my whole journey with this stuff. But this, I call it out because I feel like this kind of was a tipping point for me where I started to question or think a little bit more critically, judgmentally maybe about the rest of the things that he was going to be saying in this book. Uh, like the first three chapters kind of flew under the radar. didn't even realize till I got to this one. I'm like, hey, he didn't even really touch on this stuff. Oh, wait, he did the same thing when he was talking about gratitude. And that, I feel like, sets the tone for my, uh, for the rest of the book for me. Not in a, a positive way. Sure. I do want to point out that there was an action item I had from this section on sleep and rest and such. He mentions, because the problem with reading as many books as we do is, and this is maybe what you're getting at here, Mike, is that it's easy for us to see how it could have been better because someone else did it better, or we've been reading enough about it that we feel like we could do it Mortimer better. Mortimer Adler and has taught us well. It's true. <laughs> we He has destroyed us in being able to read a book and be completely amazed by it because <laughs> if only we had never it. read how to read a book we would yep. be so much happier it's so true <laughs> so true anyway we've we've done so much on sleep and it's come up in so many different uh so many different books at this point that we just haven't found i i don't feel like we see much whenever these topics come up there's not much new right there was a point yeah. here that was new to me in that if you take a shower at night, about 90 minutes before you go to bed, something about that helps your body relax temperature-wise and it helps you sleep better. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. I've been one that takes a morning shower for a long time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experiment with this one a little bit. All just right. Just out of curiosity. I mean, again, this is very minor, right? So I'm going to attempt to, and the way our daily routines work this actually works out well i'm gonna take a shower at night roughly an hour 15 hour and a half before before i go to bed and we'll see see if it changes how easy it is to fall asleep but just a curious thing is it wasn't even a long section really it was like two or three paragraphs no in the yep, i remember in the that whole thing but that was just one little tidbit that i thought was interesting that tidbit it was interesting to me too because growing up my dad and he had gotten this from his dad he had told me that you should take a cold shower before going to bed because that sure. will help you sleep yeah <laughs> and then, now greg mckeon is saying the exact opposite take a hot shower uh, and i think i think greg mckeon's actually right because there are a lot of people who say take a cold shower in the morning Correct. because it wakes you up and you're more alert so that's probably one of those things that has just been passed down from generation to generation. And uh, there's more science behind what Greg says, but the way that Greg says it, it sounds like the exact same thing, just changing hot and cold. It's like, oh, my 
yeah. my great great grandfather told me to do this so this is what you should do <laughs> totally my, my some dad... of the some of the go ahead uh, so, some of the the uh the lists that he has in here feel like that like the proposed work schedule dedicate the morning to essential work break down that work into three sessions and no more than 90 minutes each take a short break 10 to 15 minutes in between sessions to rest and recover so kind of like pomodoro but you don't want to get into the science behind it or give anybody credit like that's kind of yeah. how it reads it's what and I that's not too. probably what he's trying to yeah that's not what he's trying to say but that's how it comes off right right it's so true he doesn't want to credit but just you trust your uncle greg here <laughs> anyway what i was gonna say is my dad used to always make fun of people who took showers in the morning at all didn't matter hot or cold just why are you taking a shower in the morning? It's like, you should take a shower at night because you're dirty at night. And that was what he said all the time. Think about it. He's a farmer. Guess what? He's out in the dirt getting <laughs> oil and stuff yeah. on him all day long. It's like, well, of course you're going to take a shower at night. Like, that's just, this is just how it works. Like, because I'm not going to bed like that. So he was always just, why would you take a shower in the morning? It's like, didn't you just take one the night before? That doesn't make sense. There you yep. go. Take two showers every day, <laughs> one at night, 90 minutes before you go to bed that's hot, and a cold one in the morning. There you go. <laughs> Be a double shower. Yeah, no kidding. Like, that's kind of what this left me with is like, okay, so I should take a shower in the morning because that's what works for me. Yeah. And then usually if I if I put that off, uh, sometimes I'll go running, you know, late morning and I'll just shower then. But uh, if I did shower in the morning, I'm not going to skip my workout. So now I'm showering after my workout and then I'm going to shower at night because Greg told me to. Yep. <laughs> like, no, I'm not taking three showers a day. <laughs> All the great showers. But yeah. Yeah. So that's, there's another chapter here, which we won't really talk about, which is uh, notice. And this is really about distractions and attention. And again, a super deep topic that we wrote whole books on. But these five chapters, which we have spent way too much comprise this first section of the book this is also the one i think that is the most interesting to me which is maybe why i was a little bit disappointed that he didn't get into these more uh, but we should probably move on to the second section here which is effortless action now there are five chapters here i'm going to list these real quickly we're not going to go through all of these uh, chapter six is define chapter seven is start chapter eight is simplify chapter nine is progress chapter 10 is pace and this is where you basically apply all of the productivity stuff that you've heard over the years. <laughs> this is Pretty where much. GTD and such uh, comes in. I think there are a couple of things that are interesting here. Uh, the first chapter is kind of all about defining what done looks like. His advice in this section is to make a done for the day list, which I think is a good idea but also sounds like time blocking without wanting to mention Cal Newport. <laughs> and again, like that's unfair to say that, but we've read enough books and I'm like, Hey, this is totally Cal's idea where you take certain things and you put them on your calendar. Cause that's when you're going to do them, but you're going to limit the number of things that you are going to try to get done. And if you do those small amount of things, then that is a successful day. This feels like re saying that, in simpler, more undefined terms, and I don't like it. I feel like it's not super actionable. Maybe if you're just coming into this, like you're not really entrenched in the productivity space like we are, you haven't read all the books that we've read, you don't know all, all of this, the things that we, we know. And I don't say that to, to sound like, oh, we figured all these things out. It's kind of like the curse of knowledge. Like the more you learn about things, you forget what it was like to be a beginner. So I'm saying this in Greg's defense, maybe he is writing this for the beginner and I just have so far gone past that, that this speaks to me differently. What, what do you think? I actually thought it was a really cool idea and it didn't feel like it was Cal Newport's thing at all because okay. the, the, the difference I think, so Cal Newport's time blocking process, he would oftentimes refer to like if something happens to change, like changes have to happen, right? And he does refer to how that happens quite a bit. So his time block will change midday. This I don't feel like has that flair because, okay, 
how many people are listening to this? You have a task list. You might be looking at it right now because you're listening to us while you're putting together your task list for the day. Okay. So mm -hmm. people do this. You have your task to do list. And how many of us put things on there that you aspire to do that day or that you want to do that day? but aren't necessarily yeah. mandatory and you might not actually get to them. It's just a would be cool if, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point. And I, I, in the back of my head, I'm thinking the same thing you are. That's what people do. But the yep. way that he explained this, it sounds like a separate list. It does. It doesn't sound like just limit your to-do list. Make another list of the things that are absolutely critical. Yes. That's what I think it is. Now... I didn't take it as it's a separate list until you just said that. But in my head, it wasn't necessarily a here's all the things that I could do today, which is what a lot of us do, right? I do this. Yeah. And instead, it's a here are the things that at the end of the day, the day is done when these are completed. And if I have more energy, I can go on to another list elsewhere and work on them mm -hmm. if I want. Yep. But it's not necessary. Is this where he talked about upper and lower bounds? Was that later? I got that part. Uh, I can't remember. I don't I see that in my that. outline in this section, so maybe that's later. Um, I'm glad that you said that, though, because I, I honestly never thought about it that way. But you're, you're absolutely yeah. right. I completely agree with the concept of limit your task list to the things that are going to make today successful he doesn't give a number which i wish he would have done right because i think people need that otherwise they're Probably always going to end up with 10 15 20 things yeah it's three I, after it's much three. much practice i've gotten up to five <laughs> and that is it i cannot do more than five uh and so i feel like this is really ambiguous um and, and maybe if he would have framed it that way then i would completely agree with this uh it's kind of funny that I went totally the other way and I'm like, well, this is what Cal Newport is telling you to do because you have one list now and you are limiting it and you're also identifying when you're going to be doing these things. So that's the better, better method. Maybe it was just the lack of detail that completely threw that off for me and let me paint this picture of something that he was never intending to say. Yeah, I feel like it was, where is this? It's in the chapter on pace here in second part. So okay. anyway, I'll come back to that. I To me, I feel like it's in software, in project management, defining done is an important step. Right? This is this yep. is super important, especially if you're doing client work. Like, when am I actually done working for you? Like, this is really, really important. Now, if you're flying an airplane, it's pretty easy. When I land, we're done. Like, well, it's probably not that moment. It's like when we're at the gate and we're getting off the plane, like Blake would have to tell us. But there's a point at which that flight is completed, right? And when mm -hmm. it comes to so many of our day-to-day -day work, it gets hard to nail down when that time is. Like as far as like how much work that sure. I'm actually putting in. And I got to go open a door quick. That just happened. I'll be right back. <laughs> Was anybody there? I was asked to go open the door and there was no one there. <laughs> Whoops. <clears throat> Dunno, sorry about that. Where were we? No worries. Uh you're talking about the flight being over when the plane lands. Ah, yes. So defining when things are done. Done done done. But I think it's, you know, it's it's interesting that Greg has this done list for the day and he's defining, you know, at the end of the day, if I have these, call it four, three, two, whatever the number is, these three things done, I can quit working when those are completed, but I can't until those are not. 
until I, I can't mm -hmm. stop until they are done. That's just a thought yeah. process that we don't normally think about when we think about putting together a to-do list. Exactly, but it's also not at all what he was talking about in the rest of the sure. chapter. Sure, maybe this is where I wanted me. it to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I completely agree in this idea, but I think he didn't flesh it out. Sure. Yes, you should define done for your day. That is time blocking. <laughs> and you, it doesn't have to be time blocking. There can be other flavors of it, but that's how I do it. And I feel like what he told people at the end of this, my brain went to time blocking. And if you didn't have any sort of reference for this, this is kind of like pie in the sky. Well, what are you talking about, Greg? I've got all these things that I need to do. I can never get them all done. And now you're going to tell me that I just need to make them easier so that I get them all done. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think you do have to, at some point, say no, which is not really the point of this book. It's the point of the, the previous book. The rest of this chapter, I, I really enjoyed. I really like that story of, of the ship that is being built for the, the king of Sweden. And he keeps making so it good. bigger. Yeah, he wants it to be longer. He wants more cannons on it. And then by the time that it's finally done, the uh, they take it out for the, the voyage. And it tips over. <laughs> it's so heavy, it sinks like before it gets a mile from the shore. And... <laughs> The army's there and they have this parade and everybody sees it sink after they spent all this time building this giant military warship. And I thought that was kind of hilarious because there are a lot of work projects that do the same yeah. thing. But that's project-based. And I think that that's really the point he's making here and that's really the powerful idea, whether it is a personal or a professional project. He says, getting clear on what done looks like doesn't help you finish the thing but it helps you get started totally agree with that it provides the motivation because you know this is what it's going to look like when we're finished you're not going to go crazy like henrik hybertson the guy who had to kept, keep modifying the the plans um, but then at the end like the one takeaway from this chapter is okay by the way retrofit this to planning your day and like what yeah just shoehorn it in there it'll be it'll be fine yeah it'll, it'll all be the same <laughs> Reminds me of the, what is it, the F-35 project, the fighter jet mm. that the U.S. was, I think it's F-35. They could probably tell you. And ended up being like a trillion dollar project, and I don't know that it actually was completed the way they wanted it to be. I know that some of them were sold to the Israeli government and... There was all sorts of restrictions on what they could and couldn't do with them, and they just immediately like ripped out the computer and put something else in it. So <laughs> it's like it's violated so many things. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> yep, yep. A couple other things from this section on, let's see, was it Start where he was talking about the microbursts, uh, which is a meteorological surge that causes powerful winds and storms for a brief but intense period. I have a, a a real life picture of this etched into my brain because I guess it was two summers ago. I was out for a run training for my half marathon. So I did my long run. Uh, I think it was like 10 miles that day. And I run out from my house and then do this loop. So uh, basically I am not it's not like I run in a square around where I live, where I can get back super quick if I need to. I had actually gone like five miles out and had to come five miles back. On the way back, I get this weather warning. I'm about three miles from my house. I look around and I'm like, it doesn't look like anything, but uh, it was clear when I left. So maybe this is a, a fluke. Uh, I had a thought to like, stop at the park because there was this shelter there but i'm like i'm just going to keep going and then by the time i got to my house it became very evident that there was indeed a uh, a storm coming <laughs> and in fact i got home got inside and about a minute and a half later we got a ton of rain a ton of hail and we lost power for an entire week so being stuck in that would have been very very bad but i just made it back and in my mind, that's what I picture when I picture these microbursts. It's like, this comes out of nowhere and is super powerful. You have no idea that it's coming, but then it leaves an impact uh, that you see for, I mean, we didn't have power for a week afterwards, which in our area, that's 
that never happens. Like when we lose power, it's for 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but hundreds of thousands of people around us, you know, they all lost power because of this, this crazy storm. So that's the picture that I get. And when you think about making the, uh, the, the first step with something, he makes a point in this chapter that now only lasts 2.5 seconds. So if you can do something now, if you can do something in those 2.5 seconds that has that much effort or power behind it in terms of creating the outcome that you want, that's a really cool idea. Uh, you have to identify what that thing is that can provide that that big boost and leave that that impact like the microburst. But I, it's got me thinking that way. Uh, I think maybe this is a little bit of a hyperbole and an exaggeration. Like I don't think just finding the the one thing that you're supposed to do to move something forward and then doing it is is it's really fair to compare that to a, a microburst necessarily. Uh, but it's an interesting analogy. I grew up with tornadoes. So <laughs> there's so many times my grandfather used to say, you know, if the wind changes, what is it? Three times in three minutes. Like if it changes direction three times in three minutes, hit the deck. <laughs> That's what we would do. So anyway, those were, there were a number of times we saw twisters that would come touch down and then they would, go back up and then they would leave and then we would ho hear the tornado siren it's like thanks guys <laughs> thanks for, thanks for the warning appreciate that yeah did, that was the other thing well. is the sirens <laughs> never went off when i was out for my run so i was like ah, oh, no big deal yeah it's, you know, it can't but... be that big i don't know we we just growing up we always just learned to watch the weather and try to interpret it yourself instead of trusting what everybody else said uh anyway yep. one thing that you mentioned very quickly that i want to i just want to call out in a little more detail is the concept that what we consider the present like what we consider right now is a span of about 2.5 seconds that you were talking about. Does that seem weird to you? In my head, that might yeah. actually be long, but the more I think about it, it's really <laughs> short. But it's just, first off, how do they even know that? I don't have any idea how they uh -huh. would measure that, but it's just an interesting thing. It's like, okay, the present, what we consider right now is 2.5 seconds. So in this 2.5 seconds, what are you doing? Like, well, I'm making these motions with my hands so like i don't know it's just kind of an interesting side point yeah i don't really like that 2.5 seconds to be honest i get i think the point that he's making because what he's trying to get you to do is to make a decision to take action and when framed that way it only takes a couple of seconds to make that decision and do something and that thing that you do could be the microburst that allows you to take significant action on this thing that you've been procrastinating on. Although I am a little bit skeptical that if you go into it expecting those results every single time, you're going to be disappointed when <laughs> you make that decision, you make a little bit, bit of, uh, of an effort, and it doesn't have a ginormous effect every single time. A lot of times it doesn't. Uh, and especially that 2.5 seconds, like that's how long the decision may take but the actual completion of the action takes significantly longer than that. And a little bit like that 2.5 seconds, what that does in me when I read that is I can't waste a single moment. I have to make it take advantage of every 2.5 seconds, but I can tell you that that's not the way that I work. Uh, and I don't want to work that way anymore. <laughs> uh, I have a very chill uh, if you were to watch me work, you'd probably be like, is this guy doing anything? <laughs> because I uh, I know my ebbs and flows and I prioritize things in the, the morning specifically is when I, I create. Um, I, I do my morning routine like we talked about. I come down to my office and at that point, like I'll sit down to write. Uh, but when I am when I'm no longer in the flow, like I'm going to go upstairs, I'm going to refill my water bottle. I'm going to use the restroom, like do all those things. And I do that fairly frequently. Uh, I do that basically whenever I, I hit that, that wall. And so just like getting up and walking around, going outside, shooting some, some hoops, coming back in and then re-engaging with the work that allows me to do a lot in a given day. But if you're sitting there measuring like the hours that I work and the moments that I'm wasting, <laughs> right? Those are gonna add up pretty quick. And I don't like measuring 
my uh, my productivity that way. I think that's that's kind of dangerous and it kind of forces you into oh, I have to be working every single moment when really like if you want to maximize your your output, you have to get and he talks about this in pace, right? You, you have to bite off not more than you can chew. And he tells that, that great story of the, the people who are racing to the, the South Pole. And there's the one guy who's going to push his team really hard when the weather's great and they're not going to do anything when the weather's bad. And then there's the other guy who's like, we're just going to go 15 miles every single day, no matter what. And he's the one who who gets there. And the the guy who's pushing his team when it's when it's nice and then uh, not doing anything when it's when it's bad, like they're all burnt out because they're constantly sprinting and then when they're not sprinting, they're not able to fully recover. And that was a big lesson I had to learn was slow and steady <laughs> wins this race. Uh, you're not going to knock it out of the park every single day. And actually, it's better to just do a little bit here and a little bit there. And, and I guess kind of to wrap this up, what I've learned is that I can do that even throughout my day, a little bit here and a little bit there. And then when I measure it at the end of the day, I've made some significant progress. Yeah, this is this is where they introduce the Greg introduces the upper and lower bounds of work where mm-hmm. you know, apply this to writing, okay? I'm not going to stop until I've written at least 500 words, but I have to stop if I hit 1200. And that sounds so weird, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> It does. But the trick here is that there are going to be days when trying to get to 500 is a stretch. Mm -hmm. And there are days when 1,200 is easy. But the problem is that if you make it easy to stop before 500, you won't always make the progress you want. But if you allow yourself to go above the 1,200 you're going to wear yourself out such that doing tomorrow's 500 is even more difficult. Like those are the the sides of that. I think this is brilliant actually. And it's not like you hear people talk about, I got my thousand words for the day or I did my morning pages. Like you hear these things, right? Or Mm -hmm. I'm going to write a weekly newsletter or I'm going to do this and I'm going to do a thousand words a day. Like whatever that is, a video a week, whatever those are, you're a lot of times people measure the outcome instead of the stuff that goes into it. That's a whole nother topic. I'm not going to go into here, but the piece that goes into it, take the ship and the race to the South pole, right? They were deciding to do, was it 15 miles a day? I think is what it was. Yep. They chose to do the 15 miles, no more than 15 miles. And whenever they decided that it meant that they were always able to recover and they were always able to get the breaks. But on some days, it was hard to get that 15 mm-hmm. miles, right? So you're going to hurt yourself if you go beyond it. You're going to not get anywhere if you don't have that minimum piece. But the po- important part here is that they were setting up a distance. that, Like their goal was to do 15 miles a day. Their goal wasn't, they weren't looking at the South Pole saying, that's where I'm that's where my goal is. It's a good thing to do that, to keep that end in sight, but they were focused on the day to day. And I think this is the important part here that I, I want to point out. And that if you set these upper and lower bounds, and this is something I want to do for some of my creative work. I don't know what that means, uh, given that I'm trying to move a lot more into video and such. So because of that, I don't know what that looks like. How do I measure? There's no word count that I can measure on that. So, that's the piece that I want to to try to figure out that I wrote down as an action item is just determining what are those upper and lower bounds for the creative work that I do. Yeah, I, I love this. I wish the whole section was on this specific topic. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> How do you reconcile a microburst with this? I don't know. Me either. <laughs> I mean, the easy answer is you use the microburst concept to start that period. Sure. I mean, that's the easy one. Whenever you set that time to start, like if I'm going to sit down and start to work on an article, I could use mm-hmm. the microburst to start that period to get me towards the 500 words. I, I mean, I could I see I guess that. this this sounds like if microburst is a strong sudden storm, this sounds like 
gentle rainfall. Like it does. It's just a light, light rain, and it's just slow and steady, and it just is what it is. You know, there's nothing exciting about this, which is it totally might, not the picture you get with a microburst. Right. It might depend on what we're talking about, too, because in the story of upper and lower bounds, they're talking about a long-term goal that's going to take a long period to achieve, and then you're breaking mm -hmm. it up into those little pieces to work towards it. Like the creative work I'm talking about would be like that. There is no end in sight with that. But the microbursts piece from where I'm sitting would be super helpful for like cleaning up that mass of video gear I've got sitting over here in the corner. Like mm -hmm. that sort of thing would be super helpful. Or uh, what was he mentioned? The drawer that had the pencil tray that was lodged slightly <laughs> that like, had been that way for two uh, years. Yes, and the and, and the GTD expert came and fixed it in two right, minutes, and right. it solved him, saved so much frustration for for the next several years. Like I had issues with that story. But. That was so weird to me. <laughs> but the that I think that's maybe the difference is one the microburst is for things that aren't recurring, whereas the upper and lower bounds would be for things that are just ongoing. That's at least sure. how I'm reconciling it in my brain. I wish chapter seven on start, he wouldn't have even used the microburst example there because I think what he's really talking about is clarity. Clarity is not a microburst. Sure. Clarity is is knowing what the next step is. And that's really what he's talking about. Find that first obvious step, the minimum viable product, all that kind of stuff. But anyways, and then chapter eight, simplify. This one's interesting too. Uh, chapter eight and nine, I'll, I'll talk about these real, real briefly. Uh, so chapter eight is make things as simple as possible. And one of the things he talks about is maximize the steps not taken. And again, this is a little bit contradictory to the first or the chapter right before this, which is start because it's identify that next thing and then do it. And I know that these two can fit together, but I don't think you fit them together very well. I feel like uh, if you read this and start as the thing that resonates with you, then you're naturally not going to be asking yourself, well, should I be doing this thing uh, in the first place, which is what Simplify is all about. But I think that's a really important uh, idea and you should absolutely be thinking about the things that you're engaging with. Uh, the next one on progress, this one, uh, I feel like, again, there's a there's a whole book to be written on, on this, but uh, this is really talking about it requiring courage to give yourself permission to fail. So any sort of creator, I think this chapter is going to resonate with. Uh, he says to start with rubbish and to iterate, to make failure cheap. And on page 132, he even says, inspiration flows from the courage to start with rubbish. And he makes the point in here, which this resonated with me. Many people want to learn a new language, but they don't because they want to be flawless. This is totally what happened to me back in the day because I had Spanish class in high school and I could not roll my R's. I still can't roll my R's. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm not going to sound as good as Senor Wilkie, so I'm not going to do this. <laughs> I did the bare, bare minimum to get through the class and then I never went back and revisited it. But now I'm on, I have to look, I think it's like 580 something days in a row on, on Duolingo. Uh, but I had to, again, when I re-engaged with it, I had the same thing. Like, I can't roll my R's. And I, I, I went on YouTube and looked for, like, how do you roll an R? And I could never get it. But I moved past that. And ever since I gave myself permission not to roll my R's, it's a lot more enjoyable. Yes, yeah, this is similar to what we were talking about earlier. Like, we make things harder than they need to be. Like, yep. so many times, oh, I, I do this all the time all the time it's like i don't want to like i can't work on let's say editing a video i can't work on editing that video okay why well the video file hasn't been loaded into a new project for me to start working on it yet okay well why hasn't it been loaded into that well i haven't updated the software because i want to do that before i start it because there's a new feature i want to use okay why haven't you updated that I don't, I don't know. I just haven't clicked the update button. Like, 
So thus, I'm not editing a video because the software is not updated, but I just haven't clicked the button to update it. Maybe because I think it's going to restart it, but I don't know. I don't want my computer to go out of commission for those 10 <laughs> minutes. So like, uh, I do this all the time, all the time. I'm terrible. Yep. The struggle is real. All right, last part here, part three is effortless results. And the chapters here, chapter 11, learn, chapter 12, lift, chapter 13, automate, chapter 14, trust, and chapter 15, prevent. Uh, in chapter 11, learn, he talks about reading, which I thought was kind of cool. He says on page 163 specifically, reading a book is among the most high leverage activities on earth. And yes, Greg, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> he talks about the older a book is, the higher the likelihood it survives into the future, which is interesting and probably means we should read more classics. We're going to read an older book next, I think, actually. Uh, and he talks about distilling to understand instead of just, I think, like most people read. I know it's a generalization. Uh, but we both did this before we read how to read a book. It's like, you just sit down, you crank through this thing, whatever jumps out at you, jumps out at you. If you're really trying to suck everything out of a book, you're going to recreate everything the author is saying in an outline, you know, and uh, we, neither of us do that anymore <laughs> because what no. we're trying to do is we're trying to understand the principles and that gets into like the synop synoptical reading, syntopical reading. I forget how Mortimer, Mortimer Adler uh, describes it in that book about how you're comparing the author's arguments against the arguments of other authors and other books. And that's really where a lot of the, the magic happens. Um, I think the productivity books that we read tend to fall into the systems sort of a thing, like just do X, Y, Z, and you'll get these results. And he says in this section that those methods, those can be used once to produce linear results, but they really can't be applied over and over again. And really what we should be trying to get are the principles that can be applied broadly. These are the things that are universal and timeless, which I, I agree with that. And it makes me realize the value of a couple of the books that we've covered. Number one, Principles by Ray Dalio. And then the other one would be the the great mental models that we both really enjoyed. We read that one more recently. Those types of books are the ones that I really connect with now. And uh, he kind of hit the nail on the head and, and showed me why I rankle at the systems books so much. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it has to do with how much background do you have? Like he's talking about how great reading is and how to distill things it's it's interesting to me that we've inadvertently i think we have stepped more towards like more recent releases in books yeah and you know we've both picked books that are pre-order only at the time we talk about it to a year two years old like that's probably a lot of books that we've covered in recent months but he's recommending what was the the is it lindale why i forget the name litter i forget what the name of the effect is that the longer a book has been published the more likely it is to stay yep. a classic right so the older a book is the more impactful it likely is on your life so this is this is something we don't do i don't think in yeah in bookworm at least so I don't know if there's something we should do with that. You know, there are a lot of classics out there that we probably should cover at some point and just haven't. At the same time, mm -hmm. covering the newer ones is fun. <laughs> it's like because we get to like be a voice about it from from day one. So it's it's just an, a curious thing to me. I don't really have a specific point other than reading is important. You should all do it. Uh, and there was one kind of sad fact in this in that yes, there was. the number of people reading more than four books in a year is declining. Yes. That yeah, the average American sad. only reads four books a year and 25% don't read at all. And this is my issue with things like Blinkist. The Blinkist service is fine, but it encourages, or I shouldn't say encourages, enables people 
to not read the books. Come on, people, don't be lazy. Read the books. If you want to supplement that with Blinkist, go right ahead, but make sure you are reading the books. At least some books. I mean, you can't read everything. There's too much information out there, but don't be the average lazy person who doesn't read the books and then reads the Blinkist thing or listens to the Blinkist thing and then is like, there, I read the book. No, no, you did not, you did not. read that the book. That really bothers me. <laughs> that bugs me so much. It's like, by the way, bookworm is where you need to do that. Like, we're enabling people to yeah. not read too, Mike. So, like, we're... It's true. It's true. Oops. But, yes, <laughs> do go read aware the books. <laughs> we are enabling you to not read them. Here, here's what you should do. When we talk about gap books, you guys do a gap book as well. But don't read any of the books we're reading. You read the other stuff, and then you <laughs> tell us which ones we should read. And then you can get the distillation from us on the ones that we are reading. So there you go. Or use us as a filter and then go read them. That's fine, too. Just read something. You know, don't, don't just listen. Don't get the synopsis. Do the, the heavy lifting. Uh, I've... I'm a big believer in the value of that. I think that's the big reason we continue to do this is that you and I get so much out of reading the books and talking yeah. about them. <laughs> There's a lot to it for sure. Uh, I want to talk real briefly about this distill to understand though. Uh, are you familiar with the concept of progressive summarization? Progressive summarization. I don't think so. This I believe is made popular by Tiago Forte with the building a second brain stuff. Sure. And his version of this uh, is that you read something and you grab your notes from that thing. So one easy way to do this if you're doing digital stuff is like you highlight stuff on the Kindle and then you use Readwise to pull it into your, your note taking app. Okay. Then when you go back and you look at your notes, you continue to summarize. So the first time that you go through it, maybe you're gonna bold things. And then the next time that you go through those notes, you're going to highlight things. And so each time that you do it, you're condensing this entire work into less and less words until you essentially have like a very quick synopsis of what the, the author was originally saying. And I don't know that I like this idea. I, I think that they're, that summarizing things is, is valuable. I, I do that with not only the mind node files that I create, but also uh, when I transfer those notes into Obsidian, I write a three sentence summary. And I get a lot of value of forcing myself to write those three sentence summaries. But I don't ever want to go back and read all my notes and then go back and read them all again and then go back and read them all again, which is kind of implied with this idea of progressive summarization. But that's the picture that I get when he talks about distilling things down. And I was curious how you do this. I don't. All right. <laughs> that's easy, right? The, <laughs> that just seems like a ton of work to me and time that I'm not going to devote. Like there's... Right. And that's, that's kind of the thing is like, I don't think to distill, you need to do the progressive summarization, but that's the popular thing I see yep. all the time now. And I don't think that's great for everybody. I think, you know, I don't really see people talking about that at all. So maybe that just is the difference in the circles we run in sometimes. But that's that concept of reviewing them again regularly. Like that, that sounds cool. It sounds nice. But that's quite a time commitment, I would say. Maybe this is just because like I do a lot of thought work, as we call it. But I also have a lot of physical work that I do as well. Uh, before testing and everything, I was pulling cables through the wall right where this camera is. Like up, above, over, down. Like I did a whole bunch of that. Built a whole new video rack in the other room with cables and stuff in and out of it. So like that's a lot of physical stuff, right? So when mm -hmm. I have those types of projects, the time to sit and review book notes and such, the, there's no chance not even close <laughs> uh you couple that with somebody's email doesn't work i've got to go fix microsoft word being dumb and rejecting license keys once more like there's just a bunch of that stuff that i end up dealing with that's physical and i have to go somewhere to do that so the amount of time that people talk about 
devoting to building notes databases and reprocessing existing notes that are written it seems like and whenever i've experimented with those types of things it takes a significant amount of time and i never have that kind of time and i don't know if that's just sure. because i'm terrible at being an essentialism person and following the effortless tactics but just my day-to-day -day doesn't allow that sort of thing i don't feel like well, i'm see, that's... busy but <laughs> that's the thing is like this distillation this is not the effortless path <laughs> no no not at all there's a lot of effort involved here i would argue that it's worth it and sure. as martin points out in the chat even tiago says you're not going to do this with everything you're going to do this with the stuff that really strikes a chord uh, this is kind of what i do with nick milo talks about this with the the mocs and there's your favorite term again but that's really what those are is like a workshop like, where wait, you're what are we talking about again so map of content i had to translate it's like <laughs> joe's fave like i don't even know what we're talking about <laughs> yeah but that's that's the same kind of thing for me it's a distillation because i'm taking my notes and i'm pulling in pieces of them on a specific topic but that is more applicable to me than just taking like a book or an article which is how i've seen progressive summarization applied a lot of times you have this lengthy thing and then you're going through it and you're grabbing the notes, that's one pass. And then you're bolding things, that's another pass. And then you're highlighting things, that's another pass. I have no desire to do that kind of thing. And I feel like if you were to do that just within that specific article, you are missing out with bumping it up against the other things that other people have written on those specific topics. That's kind of what we were talking about with all the different books that we've read and how, how to read a book influenced that you, can get tunnel vision with this progressive summarization and you're just applying this with this specific article. And that's great. You walk out of it with a couple of sentences that really summarize everything that the author maybe is trying to say, assuming you're able to do that really, really well. And you really understand this now, but what are you going to do with those other sentences? How do you connect those to, to other things? I feel like that's still, still missing. It would be interesting to see Greg McKeown, and uh, like walk him through how I do Obsidian stuff and see what he thinks of that or if he has any suggestions on how to do it better. I, I feel like his advice is, is, he's one of the few people that I, I would listen to if they said, hey, you should do it this other way instead. Sure. Um, this, this specific section, again, he doesn't really get into a lot of detail here, but I feel like you can kind of tell he knows what he's talking about at least. It's true. I'm still not going to do... <laughs> Which That's fine. Any of it. <laughs> you're you're off the hook. Uh, we do need to talk here real briefly about chapter 13 automate because yep. this is where they talk about checklists and we hit on this a little bit earlier. And essentially this chapter is go read the checklist manifesto. He even yes. says that and snipes one of the stories. <laughs> yes. Which these the I, I guess you know this is maybe save some of this for style and rating. He tells a lot of cool stories in here, but, but a lot of these stories are taken from other places. So he tells the story of Major Hill who crashed that Boeing Model 299 because it was too complicated, even though it, it could fly longer, it could haul more cargo, more guns, whatever. It was too complicated and they crashed, you know, right after they, they took off. And, and why? Because the pilot could do something Super simple because they didn't have that checklist of things that they had to do. Um, so that I didn't really like. Uh, I feel like this chapter should not have been in here. He put it in here just because he needs to have five chapters in each of these sections. But really what he is saying is Atul Gawande talked about this a lot better than I did. Uh, there is one thing in here, though, that I think is worth talking about, and that's these cheat sheets. Okay, so that's essentially what a checklist is. I was talking to... Rosemary Orchard the other day, and she said, she made a comment about how templates are uh, essential for your brain, something along those lines. Uh, like your, your brain doesn't work right unless you're following a checklist sort of a thing. And that got me thinking, that term templates, because templates, Obsidian, you can have templates for a whole bunch of things. Text Expander is a great way to just throw a bunch of templates inside of something. Uh, but this can apply to a lot of different areas of your life. And some of the things that he calls out here are like your to-do list. That's a template, an agenda for a meeting. That's a template, an outline for a podcast. That's a template. 
And I realized that that one specifically, if I sit down and record a, a podcast without having an outline, I am terrified. And those end up awful because I'm fumbling all over my words. With Bookworm, we've kind of hit this sweet spot where we talk about these books and we put things in the outline. Sometimes we follow it, sometimes we don't. And just the fact that it's there and I can fall back on that if I need to, that's kind of the release my brain needs to engage in the conversation. Uh, I'm curious though, what other sorts of cheat sheets and checklists you have in, in your life? You could have a time bound one too. I do this for Sunday morning, both whoever's the tech person on, on, uh, on duty at that time, we have one that's a minute by minute checklist that has 750 this equipment needs turned on at 805 this equipment needs turned on at 845 the live stream needs kicked on at 850 we need to kick on the local recording like we have all of these things that are time bound so that we know when the things need to be actually accomplished and it covers from 730 to 1230 across the entire morning so like that one's pretty intense. I don't even know. I'd have to look. Last time I checked it, it's like 67, six, the high 60s number of things that are on it that has just been continually. And it's it's different per week, too. So we have a template that we drop in, and then we make tweaks depending on what's going on that Sunday morning. So I don't know. It like That's one thing that we do. That's similar to like the procedures thing, the working procedures that I've been working on. So that's mm -hmm. one piece of it. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I use. Cheat sheets. Is that, for example, one of the things that we have, and this is definitely a checklist, but yeah, we got these. They're called McSquares, and they're these, um, these like dry erase sort of things that are magnets. So they're they're on our refrigerator. Yep. And we have four of them, one for each of our boys, and we homeschool our kids. So, uh, the one of the things that Rachel does on as part of her evening routine is she puts on there all of the things that the kids have to do the next day. And each kid has their own list. And so that's what they work off of. Okay. They get up in the morning and she has like basically like an office hours type thing where she works one-on-one -on -one with each of the kids for an hour on the things that they need help with. So like Toby, for example, with classical conversations, he's in challenge now. So he's doing Latin, <laughs> right? So she's doing Latin with him and learning it alongside him. Uh, but the other kids, like all of their independent work, uh, those are the kinds of things that they'll just go and they'll they'll check them off and they'll work through that list. And sure. when we're done with the done with their list, that's when they can play video games and things like that. And it, it just got me thinking, you know, that plus the outlines plus the meeting agendas, like there are lots of different ways that you can apply these checklists. It, it's not just a checklist like the flight checklist, like, oh, I'm going to do this thing now. And so I have to make sure I follow steps. There's a lot of value in that, especially with complex tasks. I think there's a lot of places that maybe you're doing this already and you don't even really realize it. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of things that I have routine processes for, but nothing that's, I don't think I have anything for home that's documented outside of like a packing list for when we're going on a trip. That would be about that as works. much as it would be be but that's the only one i can think of that's actually detailed out and written everything else is okay either just habit mental or haphazard sure <laughs> well this is one of my action items uh it's not anything specific but i am going to look for all of the places that i can create checklists slash templates but i'm not going to sure. be rigid anymore about that term checklist it doesn't need to be a series of boxes that i actually check sure it's just any sort of template automation sort of thing like with Obsidian, I have my, my daily questions and all my journaling stuff. When I create a new daily note, all that stuff gets dropped in automatically. And Greg McKeown helped me to realize that that's actually a form of a checklist. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, I, I could see that. I mean, my wife has some, like, she, they've got their lists of things they do for school, but that doesn't involve me at all. So, like, they have sure. that. But that's about as close as I can think that they get, like, the routine of time-bound the way classical conversations is going to run and the rest of their homeschooling process. That's all there, yep. but 
Yeah, I don't think we do a ton of that. Maybe we should. Don't know. <laughs> all right, that's all I got for this section. Anything else you want to talk about with this book? I don't think so. I mean, there's so many places we could go, but I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, I will just mention in the conclusion, he tells a little bit more detail about their personal story that um, he mentions at the beginning of the book and gets into a little bit more detail about the health stuff that they are still going through with their daughter. And that was kind of the inspiration for the book is when she was dealing with stuff, he still had all of the things that he had to do and he needed to make those things more effortless. Uh, I don't really like that. I will say I don't really like that framing though because if your your kid is sick, nothing else really matters. And he, he admits that. I mean, he says as much, but he talks about how, well, I still needed to get back to the people and cancel the talks and all that sort of stuff. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, no, you don't. You don't owe anybody any explanation when your kid is is dealing with, you don't know what, you know? Family first. Uh, yeah, ideally, you don't want to burn those bridges and you don't want to, you, you don't want to let people down. But as a recovering people pleaser, <laughs> I can tell you, if you're going to disappoint somebody, <laughs> better them <laughs> than your family, yeah. especially when the in the moment when they really need you. I think, uh, maybe I just took it differently, but I think he was just talking about canceling. He wasn't talking about justifying. He was just like, Hey, yeah, that so talk in three that's days, right. I'm not going to be there. So, like, and that's what he's saying. Whereas if I took what you said to an extreme, like he just doesn't tell him he's not going to be there and doesn't show up. Well, that's not good for him either. So, Correct, correct. Now, now I'm not saying like you're going to take that approach with everything, but if your to-do list is too long and there's too many people for you to get back to, and you need to get to the hospital with your kid. Okay, I'm gonna say, let this person know, let this person know, and the other ones who I'd like to tell, I'm not gonna tell them and that's gonna be right, okay. Right, right. And I think that's what he was getting at is, but you have to keep in mind, he was book touring and a whole bunch, like, yep. so that, yep. that people who have to know is actually quite long, which is where he actually started the book with, what he started the book with in that, what happens if the essential gets to be too big mm -hmm. and you can't get it accomplished? That's so. Where's the line where with this? From. Where's the line with essential though? That's the question in my mind, Correct. and I admit that I am not as important as Greg McKeown. Yeah. <laughs> so my engagements are not at the same level as his, but I don't know. I, I kind of think the approach is still going to be the same and there's still going to be a point when you're going to say i'm sorry you know i'm, I'm not going to show up and the conference organizer is going to have to figure this out whether i get back to him or not right you right. know and that's fine you never like, want you never want to get to that point obviously but if you do you don't have to do all those things correct yep i hear you you do Anyway, he's had a rough life with his daughter, and yeah. they have a road ahead of him yet. But that's yep. ultimately what sparked this book. And right. if memory serves, this book, he had a second book deal already and then put it off because of these things like i think if i remember the introduction correctly he sure. had a plan to come out like a year or two after essentialism but it's been longer than that right so it's been put off so anyway yep lots of family I agree. Stuff. And every, everyone's everyone's got to figure this out for the, for themselves um i just uh yeah when he was getting into this this conclusion he, he's he's a great writer kind of getting into style and rating um so I'll, I'll put a pin in that, but uh, you feel the emotion in this conclusion and yep. you really do feel for his situation, but I feel like he could have articulated this a little bit better and given people permission like he did with essentialism. <laughs> like, yeah, you want to make stuff as easy as you can, but eventually life's going to punch you in the face. And at that point, 
you got to say no to stuff. Right. I don't know. It was felt to me kind of like a missed opportunity to tie both of these things together. That's all. Maybe. I don't know. All right. I feel like he did a decent job with it, but. He did a decent job. Yes, I agree. Essentialism is an unfair high bar to compare to. That's really tough, though. Like, when authors have a, a runaway hit like that, it's tough, yep. tough, tough, tough to to write a follow up of any kind because trying to live up to the success of the first is a very tall task. So, yep, when you have something like essentialism in your back pocket and you're trying to write a follow up to it, you have a long ways to go. <laughs> yep, yep. All right, action items. Uh, I mentioned one of them already, which is to consider where I can create templates, checklists uh, at the different areas of my life. And I've got another one here from the first section, chapter two, enjoy. He made this comment about these building blocks of of joy. And I like this picture. I want to identify my own building blocks of joy. (laughs) What are the things that I enjoy doing? And then how can I compare those or pair those enjoyable things with the essential things to make them more fun and more effortless. That's your thing. Yep. Those are mine. What about you? I have two and I've mentioned them both already. I'm going to start showering at night. See if that helps with some sleep scenarios. And the second is setting the upper and lower bounds for doing creative work and when and what does that look like? So, I don't know. We'll f- we'll figure that out. But those are those are the two that I'm gonna run with. Cool. All right, style and rating. This is a tough one. It is Greg McKeown, and I love me some Greg McKeown. I love his style. I love his visuals. It's a very easy read. It's not essentialism, and that's probably not fair (laughs) to Effortless or to Greg. But this one just feels like your standard cookie-cutter productivity book. Like, he was working with the editor, and they said, okay, this is the formula for a successful sequel, and he just stuck to it. There are lots of different things that he could have expounded on a lot more. And I wish what would have happened is instead of just covering all of these topics a little bit, he would have just completely left the ones alone that weren't in his wheelhouse and really leaned into the ones that you can tell there's more to be mined here. That's a personal thing. I feel like for somebody who's looking for an introductory productivity book, absolutely, I would recommend this. And I feel like for someone who's just coming into this world, this is probably more approachable. The charts and things that he has, the tables where all the different summaries of all the different things that he's talked about, that probably makes things a lot more understandable for some people. And I think there are some really powerful ideas here. Uh, I think the in the conclusion, he has this chart of like making things lighter or heavier and really the big takeaway from this is choose the simpler path 100 percent agree with that message Um, and so i think there's a lot of good stuff in here i was disappointed because i was hoping for another essentialism uh, and that's not not what we got Uh, i do think it's a good book though and it's definitely recommendable but it didn't it didn't knock me off my feet like I, I was hoping that it would and a lot of other books uh, that we've read have. So I'm going to rate it at 4.0, which is a decent rating. It, it's it's a good book, but it's not on my short list of like the top books that I would recommend for people who really want to dive into some of the stuff that you and I are excited about. Sure. I just want to point out one thing based on what you said. You know, you wished he had avoided some of the areas that weren't in his wheelhouse. And I wonder if that's even possible because yeah, the flow and the overall story that he's telling for each of the parts 
if he eliminates some of those, like take the checklist manifesto section, if he eliminates that, does it defeat the purpose of what he's trying to say? And maybe it, it just felt very regimented to me. Every section has a, has exactly five chapters and some of them, like there's not a whole lot in them. One of my nodes in my, my node file, chapter 12 lift has two things in it. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them, I've got a ton of stuff because you can really tell, like, he knows what he's talking about here. This is important. Write this down. Yeah, I wonder, and, and I've, I've been processing this, and this is something I wrote before we started here, in that I think that we are potentially the wrong audience for this. Agreed. And I, I, it's possible, Mike, that you and I are slowly becoming an audience that's hard to write for. <laughs> I completely agree. <laughs> I'm and, and ruined. I, and I, I say it because like this particular book, had I not read Work the System, had I not read Checklist Manifesto, had I not read any of our habit books, had we not read The Sleep Revolution, Margin, The Second Mountain, like if we had not read these, this would probably come across very different. Yeah. And totally. I could easily see how this particular book, I don't know why I'm pointing in my notebook because the book's over there. If I hadn't read those, this could be a very big deal. And I wonder if, if I went back and reread Essentialism now, would I be as amazed by it now as I was when I first read it? And I suspect that probably not. I would be surprised if I was, actually. And given that, it's difficult for me to look at this particular book and say that, I wish it had been so much more and that I wish it had been an essentialism because when did we read that originally? It's been it's one way of the back first books we covered yeah. at this point. So we've got over a hundred books between here and there, at least that we've recorded on even. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you came at this particular book, if you came at effortless without so much of our background, would this be a very different book to us? Probably and probably should be. Coming from my stance, like he's a great writer, I would say. Like he's very good at putting sentences and, and paragraphs, telling stories. Like he's good at doing that. And I'm with you in that there are some sections and I'm like, eh, you know, that's a cool idea, but you could have done a lot better. Or there's some sections I'm like, why is that even in there? Or that's a cool thought. How does it apply to these other thoughts? Like those are the things that were going through my brain. But mm -hmm. as I was sitting and just processing earlier, I was like, okay, if you look at each individual point, you can kind of see a whole picture that he's trying to tell. He's trying to put you in a mindset. He's trying to get you to act on that mindset and then helping you to choose which actions to do that will have long-term effects. Like that's the path he's trying to take us on. And if you don't have a lot of background in this, I think he did a really good job of it. Sure. But you and I know too much here. <laughs> and true. we know a lot of the nuances and subtleties of each of those individual pieces that he's using to get to that end story. That, I think, makes it difficult for me to say this is a five-star book. Uh, I, I think you nailed it at 4.0. I'll join you there. And it's primarily because the way that we have come at books and the way that we've like the number that we have read make it difficult to say that this is a top notch absolute must read book compared to the bank that we have in our back pocket now that said i'm not sure what it would take at this point for someone to write a book that would fit that category if you're going to write a nonfiction <laughs> book that's going to just completely blow us away and show us a whole bunch of new stuff and, you know, completely change the way we do our lives, 
that's a very tall task at this point. <laughs> it and is. I have no idea what kind of book that would have to be to have that kind of an impact. So anyway, I'm going to put it at 4.0. I think he's a great writer. I will probably recommend this to folks who don't read a lot. But folks who read a lot, it's probably not one I would say you have to read. Sure. There you go. Cool. All right. So we have a double four. We'll put this one on the shelf. What's next, Joe? The Now Habit by Neil Fior. I didn't look up how to say that. Uh, I, I'm i nervous about this one, actually. So yeah, <laughs> I think this will be interesting, given that we've been talking about working systems and building systems and choosing what you're going to do and automating things the concept of doing things right now and building a habit around right now i think mm -hmm. will be interesting and i'm not sure, sure. i'm not sure you and i are going to like this one <laughs> <laughs> that's all right anyway what are you going to pick right. for after that hmm i'm not a hundred percent sure Ooh. i'm going to give you give you two options so All I'm right. picking? So, yep, you're going to pick. Ooh. One is a recommendation from the club, Drive, by Daniel Pink, which I kind of can't believe we haven't done a Daniel Pink book yet. The other one, which we end up talking about a lot, and I just need to check this off the list at some point, is Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. I thought we did a... We did start with why. Daniel we did the Pink, new one. Uh, I don't remember. I'm we looking. did Adam Atler, which is a pink book. <laughs> That's true. We just did a search for list. Drink tank, drunk tank pink. No, you're right. We haven't. Yep. All right. So leaders eat last or drive. Yep. I feel like we have to do leaders eat last. All right. There we go. I'm kind of leaders eat last by Sin Cynic. That is the next one. All right. Sweet. And then uh, gap books. Normally we don't have gap books. This time you and I have the same gap book. And uh, that is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Great because book. for those who are joining live late, uh, Joe and David have convinced me to read a fiction book that we are going to be covering for the Relay special focused episode. Which will be fun. I'm super excited that I'm finally getting you on some fiction. I don't care where it's at. I'm totally going to be <laughs> all in on this one. So it'll be fun. Looking forward to that one. So yes, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It'll be a good time. All right. So if you are reading along, uh, you should pick up... Oh, I'm sorry. You do that part. I do the Becoming a Member part. It's true. Thank you to everybody who has uh, joined us for the live recording. The conversations that happen in this, this chat are super fun. Uh, and also thank you especially to the bookworm club premium members who are willing to support the show monetarily uh it helps us buy a few books it helps us pay some some costs like hosting and things like that and uh, we really do appreciate your support if you want to become a bookworm club premium member you get access to a couple of bonuses uh, i've got the mind node files for all the books that we cover here and i upload those to the club in a special members area there's a, a bookworm wallpaper that you can download, a couple of gap episodes that Joe's recorded. Uh, and so you get a, a few goodies, but really it's it's just a way to support the show. And everybody who has chosen to do that, we really do appreciate the fact that you're willing to support us financially and help us keep this thing running. Super excited for everybody that joins us live too. It's always, it's always fun, I think. So if you haven't already, Give us a subscribe on YouTube, like the things that helps us out quite a bit. And it'll also help you find out whenever we're doing 
a new live recording, and we'd love to have you join us for that. That said, if you are reading along, I want you to stop right now and get a head start on this book and go purchase the book, The Now Habit by Neil Fiore, and join us here in a couple weeks, and we will cover that one together. All right, stop all the things. <laughs> Marvin is the best robot ever. I think you ought to know I'm feeling awfully depressed. <laughs> all right, stopping all the recordings. <clears throat> Cool, cool. Well done, sir. You as well. I can tell I have glad you made uh, it. I can tell I haven't done this sort of thing in a while now because my voice is like, okay, I'm tired. Are we done yet? <laughs> <laughs> we are done yet. Yeah, we should go right away so Joe can go lay down. It's true. I gotta edit this, <laughs> send it to Mike, and I'll go home. All right. Great fun. Um, Indeed, Blake. So long, and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> uh, just a point. Like, I will be streaming on Monday if you guys are around. What do you have coming up, Mike? Streaming-wise? I don't know. Streaming? I don't do much live stuff. Not really. This is the only live thing I do. Slacker. But I make lots of stuff. <laughs> I do a lot of live stuff, it seems like. We do Bookworm Live. I do my live streams on Mondays and then the live stuff for Analog Joe, which I have Dave Kalo. I just found out earlier he's going to join me next Wednesday. Nice. So next week, Wednesday, I'll have him on. Talking his systems. Great fun. Cool, cool. Anyway, that said, I'm going to run. Bye, guys. All right. See y'all. But yes. Bye, all.